with that said, uh, it, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Judy Cho, who is going to talk about uh, finding drug targets. Judy? So I was given a, the rather daunting challenge of saying something helpful on finding new therapeutic uh, targets through genetics and sequencing. Um, and uh, when I was thinking about how to construct the talk, uh, I decided to divide it into two parts. One is to just very briefly uh, give three examples of kind of how genetics integrates with identifying new therapeutic targets uh, in the disease I study, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, those three examples will be the IL-23 pathway, which was one of the clearest first uh, pathways identified through GWAS. Uh, some more recent unpublished data on NOD2 mycobacterial disease and innate immune cells and then close with uh, the TNF pathway. And then um, I'll finish up by putting this in a broader context of how uh, this IBD discovery uh, may allow us to systematically leverage high throughput sequencing uh, to prioritize new targets, uh, looking at two approaches. One is driven by phenotypes, uh, and then the converse um, is uh, driven by genotypes, uh, or what was called last night as ENCODE data-driven discovery. Um, so in terms of the uh, interleukin-23 pathway uh, in immune-mediated diseases, uh, one of the first signals early on in the GWAS era was the identification of multiple protective and risk alleles that independently confer increased risk for uh, initially Crohn's disease, uh, but subsequently ulcerative colitis, psoriasis, ankylosing spondylitis, and a whole host of them. Um, and the largest effect size and the smallest p-value that we see in the interleukin-23 R uh, region um, is for an uncommon protective allele uh, at codon 381. Uh, about one out of every seven European ancestry individuals are heterozygous carriers for the glutamine allele, and this confers anywhere from a two to four-fold uh, decreased risk uh, of developing um, inflammatory bowel disease. Now, in short order, in the first Crohn's disease meta-analysis, one of the big signals that came out uh, was that the IL-23R polymorphisms um, highlighted um, a very distinct signaling pathway uh, of interleukin-23, uh, which is critical in the perpetuation of these pro-inflammatory effector Th17 cells. And if you look at the canonical members uh, of the IL-23 signaling pathway, two cytokines, two receptors, uh, two signaling intermediates, and the transcription factor STAT3, uh, of those seven canonical members of the IL-23 pathway, uh, five out of those seven uh, are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and then you combine that in subsequent years uh, of the identification that that protective risk allele uh, in IL-23R functionally uh, is a loss of function allele, and as opposed to the PTPN22 story, uh, this has been actually quite consistent between multiple different laboratories, that the less common glutamine allele is associated with decreased function, uh, as measured by either CD8 uh, TC17 cells or decreased um, STAT3 phosphorylation. Uh, clearly, this protective allele is a loss of function allele. Um, and because of that, it seems quite logical then, uh, because a lot of the criteria which have been previously discussed with respect to PCSK9 would apply similarly uh, to uh, this glutamine allele in IL-23R. It makes sense that as of what we know so far is that the heterozygous carriers of the glutamine allele, as far as we can tell, uh, do not appear to be at increased risk for infectious disease complications. And so therefore, it would seem logical uh, to block this pathway. Um, and again, this is not driven by the genetics. And uh, full disclosure, um, the blockade of the IL-12 um, and 23 pathways, these two related cytokine pathways, uh, was well underway uh, prior to the genetic discoveries. But certainly, these anti-P40 treatments uh, have been already approved uh, for the treatment of psoriasis, and with respect to inflammatory bowel disease, uh, the phase three studies are ongoing, uh, but the phase two studies uh, do look promising. Um, the genetics uh, can further inform um, this blockade of this pathway uh, in a number of different approaches. Uh, one is that we clearly have an enormous uh, 23 pathway effect. Uh, but there are some things which the genetics theoretically could help us inform, uh, whether or not it makes more sense to block the 23 pathway specifically, uh, or whether we should block both the 12 and 23 pathway. Um, again, we see associations, um, again, in, in components uh, of, of both the 12 and 23 pathways. So for example, we see an association not just the 23R, uh, but uh, the P40 subunit, which is common uh, to IL-12 and 23. And so again, uh, this is one of the issues as to whether or not um, blockade of a single cytokine is going to be more effective or blockade of multiple cytokines. A related question is also we see associations all along this pathway. At what level uh, along that should we block? Uh, should we block at the cytokine pathway, which is the classical approach, 
uh, but more kind of recent um, uh, approaches in industry uh, is to block downstream uh, through various jack inhibitors. And so these are kind of open questions. Uh, when you look at the totality of the cytokines and cytokine receptors that are associated in immune-mediated diseases, uh, I think this is going to be very complex to work out. Uh, the second kind of vignette I want to talk about is a more recent story with respect to NOD2 mycobacterial disease and innate immune cells. Uh, this is a result of the immunochip uh, collaboration in inflammatory bowel disease, uh, which has involved um, a large number of IBD cases as well as controls. And the net effect of this very extensive amount of work um, has been the identification of 71 new loci in inflammatory bowel disease, uh, which brings our present total to 163 loci uh, with genome-wide significant evidence for association. If you look at the boundaries for these associations, this encompasses about 1,500 genes. Uh, now, this large number of loci uh, for a complex disorder provides an unprecedented opportunity to utilize these loci to perform improved um, network analysis through systems biology. Uh, this was uh, led by Eric Schatt, using a lot of the co-expression networks uh, that he's previously published on. Um, and so the question, the first question we asked is, if you take all those 1,500 genes within these loci, um, within these co-expression networks that have been previously described by Eric, uh, which one of these co-expression networks is most enriched for IBD genes? And our top module was for an omental adipose um, subnetwork, which is enriched in these innate immune cells or macrophage uh, patients, uh, macrophage um, cells obtained from obese patients. And so, um, basically, I kind of went over this, and this particular co-expression module is a 523 gene module um, uh, from adipose tissue, and then this is what it looks like um, in a cytoscape file, and the pink nodes represent genes that are contained within IBD-associated loci, and we see a cluster um, of, in this force-directed cytoscape file of, nod, of, of variants uh, which contains NOD2 uh, within this pink cluster in the middle of this uh, gene module. When you drill down and look at the precise uh, nod 2 centric view of the submodule, we can see that there are seven uh, IBD associated uh, station genes um, within, with the exception of one, I think it was, um, within at least three edges uh, of nod 2 uh, and what's striking about this particular kind of NOD2 area is the, kind of the association and overlap uh, between NOD2 and uh, mycobacterial disease. Uh, we identified, for example, a new Crohn-specific association to LGLS9, which is involved in autophagy. It's induced in MTB infection. Uh, a genome-wide sRNA screen established that knockdown of LGLS9 modulates intracellular levels of mycobacteria. Uh, and it also is involved in apoptosis of activated uh, CD4 T cells. Um, some genes that have uh, been implicated in candidate gene studies uh, to MTB susceptibility, such as NRAMP1 and the vitamin D receptor, are also clustering close to the NOD2 story. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner uh, a triad of NOD2, IL-10, and HCK. So IL-10 is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, and Mendelian forms of IBD include uh, autosomal recessive mutations in either the cytokine or the receptor. We see highly correlated RNA expression between NOD2, IL-10, and this new IBD gene, uh, HCK, or hematopoietic cell kinase. And HCK is critical for the differentiation of these anti-inflammatory, or M2 macrophages, that secrete high levels of the anti-inflammatory IL-10, identifying a potential new therapeutic target uh, for inflammatory bowel disease. A couple comments about the TNF pathway. To a large extent, even though the, the, we don't see an obvious signal uh, for the TNF pathway in these IBD associations, um, I think IBD can be considered to be a TNF-mediated disorder. If you make mice that overexpress TNF, they developed ileitis and arthritis, the two diseases for which anti-TNF therapies are utilized. Uh, Anti-TNF really is the mainstay of treatment for moderate to severe IBD. Uh, although we don't see a direct signature of TNF pathway associations, uh, we see multiple mediated signals at the nf -kappa b level as outlined there. And crucially, um, when you treat IBD patients uh, with anti-TNF, if they have evidence for latent MTB, or they have latent MTB uh, one of the early uh, side effects that was noticed uh, with anti-TNF therapy was reactivation of tuberculosis uh, as a side effect of anti-TNF therapy. 
And so um, I think that one of the things that also that might be useful through sequencing is to better understand how established effective therapies actually work in the genome era. And so this was a paper from David Baltimore looking at the transcriptional profile uh, of cells in response to TNF stimulation, and you can divide them into red, green, and blue. Uh, the blue uh, genes are characterized by having few A-rich elements in their three prime UTR and very stable mRNA levels. Uh, some of them are moderately stable that have two to four A-rich elements in the three prime untranslated region as de demonstrated by the green. And some of the key genes in um, response to TNF stimulation are these red genes, uh, which are characterized by having many A-rich elements in the three prime UTR and having a very unstable mRNA profile. And so in terms of uh, kind of specific genes, TNF itself is a red gene, one of the IBD-associated genes and a very important immune-mediated gene, uh, A20 or TNF AIP3, is also another red gene. An IBD association in CCL2, the maximal association <coughs> signal that we see is actually within the three prime UTR, and again, identifying what its functional effects has yet been done. And then finally, in our latest immunochip data, when we do go pathway analysis, one of the big signals that we see are genes that, uh, that, that mediate ubiquitination and deubiquitination as outlined here. Uh, 15 loci uh, are, are actually involved in ubiquitination and deubiquitination, which mediates a lot of these uh, kinetics of gene expression. So how do we systematically leverage high-throughput sequencing to prioritize uh, new targets, uh, phenotype to genotype? Uh, we've talked throughout this meeting a lot about some of these stories, these loss of protectable alleles as ideal therapeutic targets. Uh, we gave the two examples. Other examples would be CCR5 and HIV infection. And again, an, um, uh, IFIH1 and type 1 diabetes, again, therapeutically, we don't know this yet. Uh, but it also highlights the value of targeted resequencing uh, around GWAS signals. And uh, as we identify protective alleles, this will provide enormous structure function data that will be useful for improved therapeutic targeting. Uh, other ways uh, are fairly obvious. Uh, early onset severe cases. Uh, nowadays, uh, the, the clinicians who actually identified these Mendelian cases of I IBD of loss of uh, function of the IL-10 cytokine or receptor, um, they state now that uh, when they see these young kids with early onset IBD, they will sequence and proceed with bone marrow transplantation uh, if they see a characteristic clinical uh, picture of this. And again, earlier mention was made of this Milwaukee case uh, of a Nick Volker young boy with early onset I uh, IBD and was found to have an, uh, a mutation uh, in XIAP, which is absolutely essential uh, for NOD2 mediated signaling. Uh, it also highlights the value of omics data and systems biology and two obvious uh, kind of sequencing uh, approaches that can refine systems biology approaches. Uh, we are now in the process of doing RNA-seq uh, to improve quantification in these large expression data sets. It will be more quantitative than uh, microarrays and obviously chip-seq. And then just close with cross-phenotype analysis uh, and the importance, I think, we have very large mature uh, we have large mature collections of immune-mediated diseases, but less mature uh, are infectious diseases. And in terms of this pleiotropy story, if you look at the IBD loci, the immune-mediated disease loci, uh, what's striking is that by GWAS of leprosy, of the seven leprosy loci, seven are also IBD loci, as outlined here. Uh, if you look uh, conversely at these more Mendelian single G's primary immune, immune deficiencies, uh, we can see that uh, of the MSMD genes, the Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease, six out of eight of those MSMD genes are within IBD loci, as outlined here. And so this interferon gamma R2 overlap between MSMD and IBD is of interest, and it provides a good kind of transition to the genotype to phenotype approach. Uh, and this was a very uh, elegant study from Jean Laurent Casanova, where they were looking at kids uh, that presented with MSMD uh, that had autosomal recessive mutations and interferon gamma R2. And what it was was actually a gain of glycosylation. So you can't just annotate the genome once. Every mutation that you identified could potentially result in the identification of new, um, of new um, functional motifs. So this is my last slide, genotype to phenotype, the ENCODE approach, um, you know, the importance of kind of re-annotating as we resequence and identify these new missense mutations, uh, looking at uh, covalent modifications, uh, glycosylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitination sites uh, really should all be part of this. And it's not just looking at the base uh, function, but also as you identify new mutations, 
uh, identifying these new functional moieties. Uh, obvious examples of regulation of expression as outlined there. And I think crucial in the analysis and information dissemination as we do this is really to assess critically the validity and the magnitude of effects. Biologists are not gonna care about small effects. Um, and so, you know, again, what, this is fairly obvious, but bioinformatic probability versus experimental validation, uh, frequency versus population specificity, and as we identify these rare variants, uh, distinguishing negative selection from drift. Thank you, that was spectacular. I mean, I have to say that, you know, f coming from a different discipline, it's just amazing to look and see how rich this that world is compared to some of the other worlds. It just, you know, we, we salute you. And with that, I'd like to, to ask a question. As, as you start to look at pathways, and most of the things in my mind that have been published as pathways are evangelically believed by the authors who create those pathways, but are rarely really validated in many systems, but here you really have that opportunity to group related things. Are you able to extend that so that the discovery of some of the variants in places that were not in the already canonically established, you know, pathways of immune response, that they could be pulled into this or not? Because uh, it, you know, it really is a very good example of where we really have something concrete to understand pathway as opposed to just sort of trying to organize our favorite genes and, and make very good sort of hand-waving explanations for why we think these are going to be related to each other, but really don't have, you know, the, the kind of gravitas that you clearly have in this field. So um, for, for the immunochip analysis, we did both kind of the canonical pathway analysis as well as kind of these expression co-expression data sets from Eric Schatt that Eric Schatt provided. And I think that we, we utilized both of them for this. But what was really convincing to me um, in, in analyzing these data sets was the fact that uh, th th we're taking these pre-configured modules the, that were just these macrophage rich module here. And when Eric first did the analysis, he actually did, he called it CARD15. We were actually most interested in LGAS9, that was my, my favorite new gene. And he said, well, let's look at the submodule around that, and then CARD15 was close to it. And I said, that's actually NOD2. And then you see this clustering, again, of all of these MTB genes. And so it's a kind of a, a congregated effect uh, that kind of, from a biologic perspective, was unexpected and convinced me as kind of proof. I think additional levels of proof will be to try to validate this in an independent data set. So this was done out of, I mean, an argument can be made, this was omental adipose tissue. Um, and how relevant is that to IBD? I can actually tell you a story how it actually is relevant to IBD, but uh, we'd be very interested. We're in the process of taking ileal tissue from about 500 Crohn's patients and trying to do um, RNA sequencing on that. So if you see the same network in, an, in a more disease-relevant tissue, that'll provide additional validation for this. Uh, that was wonderful. It um, played to some of my longstanding biases about kind of how, how this field could uh, most constructively develop. Uh, I already mentioned earlier that I, I like the emphasis on therapeutic targets and sort of better treatments that are going to work on a fairly substantial part of the patient population and would just reiterate my skepticism uh, that our future really lies in a lot of highly predictive kind of clinical uh, activity. Uh, for a long time, uh, 10 or 15 years, I've been actually trying to interest uh, various uh, institutes in taking sort of more interest in this sort of loss of function as a model for a perfect drug idea in genetics. And, and uh, I'm also very pleased to see uh, that uh, there's starting to be some real resonance. Francis, for example, last night was talking about this. I, I'd just like to point out that uh, I think that this idea is more radical than it is often recognized to be. There are some clear-cut examples, uh, such as the ones that you cited, uh, that seem to fit very normally into our usual way of doing business and come out of fairly conventional studies. Uh, but I would argue that uh, the way that we're just sort of organized to do biomedical research uh, uh, only almost by accident uh, discovers these examples. It has no strategy to go and look for them. Uh, and I'll just emphasize that with a, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, the 
the patients of interest here are often atypical. Uh, they're people that are not as sick as expected, um, but we still insist that they meet some long set of diagnostic criteria for IBD, for CF, for schizophrenia, or for whatever. Uh, but the real uh, sort of mother load of this type of analysis is likely to involve patients that don't meet all those diagnostic criteria. Indeed, they may very well be patients that underutilize the healthcare system because they're just doing pretty well. Uh, whereas we focus this tremendous amount of attention on the subset of patients that uh, engage the healthcare system intensively. Uh, to try to do something about that, uh, is not so straightforward and would require uh, the will uh, to change our way of doing things fairly substantially. And I just would generally encourage in the context of, sort of thinking about cohort sequencing and trying to integrate uh, data intensive biology with uh, <coughs> medical records and so forth that uh, you know, we just recognize that, uh, that we can potentially do something really new here at least new being done on any large scale. And your other point I, I liked uh, very much was this cross phenotype analysis, which of course is ubiquitous in uh, sort of immune related phenotypes, which actually is probably a fairly high fraction of all phenotypes. Uh, we just uh, have trouble sort of identifying such factors, but in many areas, uh, we're gonna have to do this kind of cross phenotype analysis. Uh, the final point is that uh, an interesting feature of this path towards sort of new therapeutics is that it actually doesn't require uh, the kind of very deep mechanistic understanding that much of our contemporary research focuses on. Uh, we don't really know, you know, why CCR5 uh, mutations have such dramatic effects. Uh, there are a lot of people trying to understand the precise role of this co-receptor HIV infection. Uh, it's not really terribly relevant because once discovered the phenotype of null, homozygous null individuals there are so, so dramatic uh, that it uh, suggests a, sort of a novel therapeutic target. And I think that's often going to be the case. Uh, but all of these uh, ideas do run rather counter uh, to the sort of standard Bethesda model about how, uh, how we actually discover things that are going to have health benefits. And uh, there are many strengths to this model, and I don't, don't want to imply otherwise. Uh, but I think the time is here to try to think more radically about how we can change this model uh, and still meet uh, many of the ongoing requirements of more conventional study designs. Mandy, can I just follow up and ask you, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons we're here is is to talk about large cohorts in large, large studies where we would not necessarily have nested case control, you know, biases for selecting and, and drawing people in. So really, what I'm hearing you say is it's really the, the most heavily phenotyped group that would be of the most interest to you that would give the greatest opportunity for discovery of these sort of borderline or under the radar variants that probably do have some medical and most importantly biologic insights. Not that we have to know what all the biologic insights are. So, so to, that, to that end, how confident are you in the phenotypes? Because there is an awful lot of heterogeneity in how phenotypes are both defined and collected. And I, and I think, you know, we'll only find out once we go down that road, but uh, just curious uh, your thoughts on that. Yes, I, the implication of my, my uh, view is that, that the richly phenotyped individuals are the best candidates for this uh, strategy. Uh, and by rich, as we discussed, I think, last night, uh, I tend to mean broad as opposed to extremely deep. Uh, but uh, so how confident I am? Uh, not very confident. The, uh, you know, it's a well-known problem that uh, there's poor concordance between even standard laboratory tests and certainly the way that physicians kind of on the whole size people up. 
On the other hand, I think that we have to overcome these problems mostly with large numbers. Uh, there, there is a tendency, I think, uh, in Bethesda, to uh, try to try to uh, sort of let the the perfect be the enemy of the good. That uh, you know, we we'd all love you know to have a hundred thousand people that uh, had agreed to you know have virtually anything done to them and that had signed up for life and uh, came back every six months and went to the clinical center and we did everything we know how to do with them and so forth. Uh, you know, this isn't going to happen for a lot of reasons. It's, um, but probably at the core of it is that it's prohibitively expensive and requires a kind of centralized infrastructure that, uh, you know, that will, that will suck resources uh, for, uh, you know, for, for all time to come. It discourages local initiatives. There are a lot of problems with that model. So that leaves us with a healthcare system. And uh, I think that's where we have to go. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to start with the most problematic cases uh, of, of, of health care providers. You know, we want to start with, uh, there are plenty of them out there uh, that are, you know, that are really uh, very concerned about uh, phenotyping consistency, at least diagnostic consistency within their own organization and are pushing their physicians to do things in more standard ways, keep more systematic records and so forth, and th those are our friends. Rory, I'm glad you put your hand up before I was going to call on you to respond. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, there's a lot of hand waving around this issue of deep versus wide phenotyping, and I think it, you know, people tend to divide into lumpers and splitters, and you know, we get all these kind of caricatures. But I wondered whether there was you know, some way in which we could try to get a bit more quantitative about the value of. Uh, I mean, are you better off with a thousand people really very uh, very well phenotyped or um, at the same cost uh, with 100,000 uh, much less well uh, phenotyped. And um, if one looks at, say, the, the experience of GWAS, uh, um, there was a huge amount of effort put in at the beginning of some of those studies about how you define the disease characteristics of the people that were going to be included in the different studies. And lots of different people used different definitions, and they spent lots of time working out what the definitions were. And then having done that, they then did meta-analyses of all of these different GWASs using all these different definitions, which they don't even bother now to worry about, and get results. So um, you was that original strategy wrong, um, would it, you, is there something to be learnt from that in terms of the next 10 years of where does one put one's resource? Is it scale um, uh, or, is it, or is it depth? Um, well, let me ask Peter. I mean, you, you spoke about analytic approaches and I think, you know, there, there is a big difference between looking at variants that are 1%, 10%, 0.1%, and 0.001%, and the question is, even if we have the most pristine phenotyped individuals, but only a thousand of them, are we going to, is, is that going to overcome the, the testing problems of at least discovering what, what's worth following up? A couple of comments. I think Rory's absolutely right that the lesson from uh, GWAS was that actually phenotyping really careful phenotyping wasn't as critical as might have been thought. And by lumping things together, the way I think about it is if the phenotype is not quite as good as you think, but you can uh, increase sample sizes, then the extra power will get over the noise you introduce through not phenotyping well. Uh, and I think that's a pretty clear message from the, a pretty clear message from the GM-wide association studies. Um, I think in terms of sequence-based studies, there's a, as we've said, and I've said a few times, there's a lot of evidence that uh, affects at the rarer variants aren't perhaps as large as we may have thought they are. And so we need to do quite large studies. So there's no point, I don't think there's any point doing a thousand people who are deeply phenotyped because we won't have power to see anything in them, uh, even with the exquisite phenotyping. Uh, I think we need to do large studies and then amongst those large studies, you know, as much phenotyping as we can get would be good. Could I, could I just follow up? Uh, you, you've said several times that uh, that best evidence is that many of these rare variants have small effects, and I, I'm just curious, what, what studies are you talking about or what, what kind of analysis? 
So I have in mind things like, uh, and others are involved in the studies more directly, so I can speak to them, but the large ESP uh, sequencing project, that's 7,000 exomes across a range of phenotypes, uh, type 2 diabetes uh, sequencing of, in the project I'm involved in, uh, 3,000 people, half case and half controls, uh, both exomes and whole genome, and then there's another project which is 5,000 exomes. Uh, those analyses aren't complete, but they're not uh, awash with examples of low frequency or rare variants of, of substantial effects, I think it's fair to say. Rare variants that have large effects with, uh, you know, with rare variants that have small effects or even opposite effects. Or, I mean, you, can't, you don't have any power to tell whether a particular rare variant is having a big effect. Uh, that's correct, but the only way we'll see those signals is somehow aggregating, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Just one comment about, so, so this is in response to Rory's original question. If you have, ten, uh, the question was whether you have 1,000 exquisitely phenotype patients or 100,000 not so exquisitely phenotype patients, but the, when, you, when, we, when we start to do these studies, what we're going to want to do is start to look at subgroups, and a thousand exquisitely phenotyped patients won't get us anywhere because, because there won't be enough in whatever subgroup you want to look at, whether it's people who respond to a drug or whether people who have inflammatory bowel disease who then go on and get uh, arthritis or, or whatever. So I, I would argue that, that the nature of the problem or the promise of the problem means that we have to have large numbers. I mean. Uh, uh, because we're going to want to look at these subsets. But we look at the subsets. Exquisitely subset. phenotyped. And right. everybody wants to sort of say, assuming they're exquisitely phenotyped, what do we do about the genomics? I'd say, you know, assuming the genomics are under control, how do we deal with the phenotyping problem? Because I think it's in, 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 in across the set and, and, and each subset. I, mean, I think that there, there is a problem. I think that's exactly right. And the, the message of the numbers is we have to be relative, it's got to be large, that means it can't be deep, it, it's got to be breadth, but it somehow has to have things able to connect onto it. And that's not, that can be simple, as in, let it, you mentioned in your consortium, Michael, I think you have a family group and you have a case control group, and so part of designing the set, the core, the workhorse, is it needs to have the 20 major things well done, and it needs to be able to talk to or link onto even sequencing itself will only be done on a very small fraction of whatever that total common space is. It's got to be broad with the capacity to go deep where it needs to go deep. It, 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 can't, it cannot be just one or the other. And it could not possibly have the depth that people have talked about and the breadth for the numbers out of the question. So we're just looking for a modular system. I mean, it, the one point I think we'll talk about later today is, you know, I, I think a premium value is the capacity to revisit, to recontact subjects who are involved, because as the discovery goes on and, and you may have a small subset of phenotypes you start with, their observations that may take you with other ancillary or other published information to conclusions that you would want to then come back to that same group having sequenced, you know, X number of, well, you know, thousands and thousands of individuals. So I think that's certainly something to think about for later today. I Just two, two points. One is on the phenotype um, resolution or, or um, accuracy. I mean, I definitely agree with Rory that larger sample sizes will probably drown out a lot of, of these things, but I think that we don't really know from the GWAS studies um, whether, you know, the size to the, the extent to which the large sample sizes was drowning out um, the, the noise of the phenotypes. I mean, I'll use as an example heart rate. There are some, some GWAS that I've been involved in that have used a pretty exquisitely defined heart rate by an electrocardiogram. And then there are other larger ones that have used a, a hodgepodge of both electrocardiograms and pulse rate that's reported in a, which I would view as probably a not as accurate. Um, um, but, you know, and signals come out of that, but the, but the true test hasn't been, been conducted, which is with the same sample size using either pulse rate or ECG, what, how many more signals do you, do you pull out of a GWAS from that? And my guess would be you'd pull out more from the more accurate 
ECG than from the pulse rate. So I think that we're not really, I don't think we really have that information as far as, especially when we're talking about $10 million will pay for only 2,000 whole genomes is what we heard yesterday. Um, uh, so, you know, are you going to pick those whole genomes on, on, the, on the ECGs or on, on the pulse rates is, is a way of looking at it. It depends whether you're comparing like with like. If you have the same number with the ECG versus um, not ECG, then I would accept that uh, you might be better off with the ECG. But if you have 10 times the number um, that uh, are based on, on a record rather than on the ECG, are, are you better off without the ECG? And that's why I was saying I think one needs to be quantitative because um, you, where should you put your resource in terms of getting the biggest return? Um, and I would argue that you get a bigger return, t typically, not in every case, by putting it into to large scale. Um, and then, uh, as Patricia said, have the opportunity to, to go into detail in certain instances, but not do it as a, 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 at the beginning. Well, and I would, would add to that, that that it's fine to have ECG defined heart rate as an example. We won't pick on the ECG, but um, but you're not going to have that in every cohort. And, and you're, you're also going to want to use multiple phenotypes to compare to the genome, because once you have the genome, obviously, just like with GWAS, you can relate it to anything. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it, it's fine if you're studying a very narrow thing. I think what we're talking about here with, a, a you know, if we were to do a million-person cohort, we would want as, as broad as possible and somewhat superficial, so at least we get some hints and then can pursue more deeply. I have one other comment because um, um, the presentation we just heard was such an elegant illustration of how metabochip, so, uh, so it wasn't sequencing, it was actually a, a chip that was actually, wouldn't have existed, I would argue, unless the NHGRI had supported the 1,000 Genomes Project because a lot of these chips, not only metabochip, but cardio chip, um, uh, what's the other, metabochip, immunochip, oh no, no, use immunochip, I'm sorry, not, not metabochip, but there's all the chips. So the question is, and I think that we're beginning to learn now what we're getting out of those, those, those um, follow-up, you know, genotypings. And so should that be part of this discussion that with a limited dollar that, you know, sequencing on some, some individuals and metabo chip or whatever chip on, on others? I'm seeing Eric nod his head no. <laughs> so, but I'm just curious because it, it's a way to extend in the, the findings to, a, to an entire, to a much larger phenotype population. Um, so... And I think similar to, to that, I think the, arg the argument has been made that if you, if you do a, a dense chip in a population that has been sequenced when it's the, you know, the same, if you can hope, the same population, the same ancestry, and that, that, that the imputation is probably better, is that a, a fair thing to say, and, and may help you um, with, with being able to impute back? I, I know the Icelanders make that argument. I'm not sure if you'd buy it. Yeah, I think that's, that's certainly true in Iceland. Uh, it's probably true in Finland. It may be true in some other really extreme founder populations. It'll be truer uh, in larger outbred populations. You'll do better imputing if you've got uh, good sequence data in the same population. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it, imputation, imputation gets harder and harder as variants get rarer. Um, and, yeah, so we need to think a little bit about the frequency range in which we're imputing now or would be able to impute and how much action there might be in that range. So a lot of that is a function of the reference populations that, that you have, uh, you know, I mean when we look at a lot of the cancer meta-analyses that are going on, we have not seen the Goldilocks variants and we've actually used the 5 million and 2.5 million chips in some very large studies and not found things that are two and a half, three. Three and a half. Again, coming back to your question, Maynard, and I think the imputation has really been hampered by the, you know, the the references making it difficult to get to two percent and below with as much accuracy as we would like to be able to do it. Where, uh, you know, but that's probably a matter of time before enough individuals are sequenced and higher higher coverage that gives greater certainty of those those lesser frequent uh, variants. But. I mean, that, that is a tractable issue, I think, over time.
And couldn't couldn't part of I'm sorry could, couldn't part of this be be related not only to the, the rarer variant but the fact that that if we were to get more finely defined reference populations we could assume a certain degree of LD in those populations and so so could we take an individual from you know the, the mongrels that make up the U.S. population and and basically say all right in this region here is their ancestry and this is the reference segment that one should impute to, and in that region, now that's a, a complicated analysis and may not get you anywhere, but it, wouldn't that be a, a better way to approach it than just to sort of, uh, you, you can only look at, at fins that you know have four Finnish grandparents? Uh, yeah, I don't disagree. I think it's quite helpful for the, in these kinds of discussions to distinguish between what some people call low frequency variants, things in the kind of half a percent, one percent, two percent, three percent range, and things with frequencies lower than that. I think imputation has potential mileage. You know, it does better in better popula in some populations than others. It does better with better reference panels, uh, and it does have mileage in the kind of half a percent, one percent, two percent, what I call low frequency variants. Uh, there's a limit to how well we'll ever do with imputation for rarer variants than that. And I think I think it's quite helpful to be careful of terminology and 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 to to focus the discussion on one or the other for certain purposes. Can I turn the discussion around 180 degrees and ask the phenotype question that, oh, that some talk about is imputing phenotypes, being able to take a certain amount of information from questionnaires and studies, which I think as we look at some of the cohorts and some of the studies, the, the, these are clearly addressed. I mean, there's a whole epidemiologic literature on this. You know, we, we're talking about imputing genotypes, but on the other side, you know, we may get to the point that we have 85 or 90 percent of the sequence that we want, but we have individuals who have different parts of what we would think would be the sort of the, the master plan of, of phenotypes and how well and how robustly we can impute those phenotypes across those populations. But no, but this is a, a very active field, and I'm just, I see some heads nodding. I'd, I'd love some comments on that. Yeah, I mean, this is a great point. And um, so, so in Framingham, we've been thinking a lot about this, and there's two scenarios. One is when it's missing, and the other is when there's a drug treatment, and you're trying to think, well, what would the phenotype have been if it hadn't, if it what weren't a treated phenotype, which, of course, is, is a what if, but it's but it actually is important if you're thinking about not only genetics but epidemiology. So, so it, the, the point you're making is it can be done, it has been done, and I think it's something we should be thinking about. I, I'd only add that it, that it, it, it I'd echo what Chris just said, and, and that it, it probably comes back to this business of rare versus really rare. I mean, the rare, rare phenotypes are going to be hard to impute, just like the rare genotypes are going to be hard or impossible to impute. And that may be where some of the mileage that we're looking at comes, but uh, it's, it's it's unlikely that one project or one resource is going to solve all the problems that are around this table. But do you, you think that, both of you, do you think, I mean, having spoken about it, do you think that these, this is a viable uh, aspect that can be added to the study? You know, it, I mean, it, some people it, like uh, I'll let, Julie's going to talk about phenotyping this afternoon, so, so I'll let her answer the question this afternoon. But my, my, my preliminary answer would be it needs work. But it, it, as Chris says, people have been looking at imputing phenotypes, and, and, it, and it's an interesting <laughs> thing to do with an incomplete data set. And you'd have to have, correlate, you have to have correlate, correlated traits that have right. been measured in order to, to do the to imputation. So that's the bottom line, basically. Well, like correlated genotypes. Mike <laughs> had raised about you know being able to go from CF to COPD to smoking or whatever. I mean, the, these related traits and how well they translate you know, as individual analyses as opposed to being able to impute to increase your sample size or to identify, you know, what the validation would be. And I would argue that the ultimate imputed phenotype is LDL cholesterol. I mean, it's, you know, it's calculated. It's, it's based on HDL and triglycerides below triglyceride, triglyceride level of a certain amount. So, so, you know, we've been doing this for decades, and, and there's no reason we couldn't, you know, pursue it a little bit further. <laughs> All right. I, I think we, at this point, we probably will, will now take a pause and um, I think Thomas is going to show a couple of slides.